Welcome to CEC Gurukul Lecture in continuation with the series on Indian sociological tradition. I am going to talk about Professor M. N. Srinivas and his contribution to Indian sociology. As I have already talked in the previous lecture that Professor Srinivas is one of the most important uh, figure in Indian sociology in terms of giving us a new paradigm, a paradigm shift in understanding society in India. He gives us a very important method that is the ethnographic field based understanding of society in India and he also kind of especially in the context of India kind of uh, negates the distinction between sociology and anthropology because in the mo most of the western uh, uh, context in which the disciplines were emerging there was an understanding that sociology and anthropology are kind of two disciplines because uh, sociology studies their own society and anthropology studies the other society. But in the case of India we see that India is such a complex collection of uh, uh, diverse background, religion, caste, community that an Indian can attempt, an in, a sociologist or an anthropologist can attempt to the study the self in others in that is you can kind of initiate as to being a Brahmin you can take up the study of say the untouchables or uh, uh, so for, for instance uh, you can be a, a man and take up a study of gender relation or women centered study is for just taking very uh, common example. But the idea is that the divide between sociology and anthropology is actually not workable in the context of India and this is kind of given to us by Professor M. N. Srinivas. To try to understand that Professor Srinivas has contributed kind of almost laid down the foundation pillar of the sociology in India. And in this lecture, I will be looking at this most important concepts that has been used by Professor Srinivas to study caste system, the process of social change and also to understand society uh, uh, of, uh, uh, in India from a completely indigenous and a completely non-Western outlook. So, to try to understand that he is kind of uh, able to construct a sociology which use the Indian experience to frame sociological principle and this becomes very important because as I have already said in the previous lecture that much of the conceptualization or the study of India as an object was kind of given to us by outside western uh, scholars and uh, they were giving us an orientalist view and most of the time the comparison would locate India on the negative side in terms of India being a static society, India being a kind of a closed society and some of the structures of Indian society kind of not being conducive for progress and development. Now, where you have this kind of an idea already there comes in an individual who questions these existing paradigm and brings in its own paradigm to understand society in India. Srinivas felt the sociology in the country needed to study Indian society in a totality a study which would integrate the various groups in interrelationship. This is where he brings in the un whole idea that we cannot understand society in terms of fragments. We have to study it as one complex reality and that is a kind of a huge task in front of the sociologist to arrive at the own interpretative understanding of institutions and structures all around. Given these factors for Srinivas, the project of social anthropology became synonymous with sociology. So, he was not in favor of considering them as two different uh, uh, discipline. It was a kind of uh, kind of considered to be synonymous or kind of uh, for instance ethnography, uh, field view, eth anthropological methods were being kind of used by sociologists in India in order to arrive at a study of the society. In doing this, he contested the popular understanding of sociology in its American form, that of conducting survey through opinion polls and questionnaire and gave the alternative methodology of field work. So, when we look into the relation between sociology and anthropology, uh, uh, Srinivas gives us two. One is that uh, uh, it is not necessary that sociology is doing more of a kind of an, uh, quantitative study and anthropology is doing in depth field work. 
either can be done. So, for instance, sociologists can do ethnographic study, whereas anthropologists can rely on quantitative method. The second distinction between sociology and anthropology in terms of sociology studying their own society and anthropology studying the other society is also quite a kind of rejected or kind of negated. Sociologists can study the other society and anthropologists can study their own society. So, this was the paradigm shift that Srinivas brings into sociology in India. Now, when we try to actually look into his contribution to Indian society, as I have already said, he brings in a large number of concepts to make us understand the process of transformation and social change which was happening in India. So, social change was occurring from the evolution of society, but when we talk about Indian society, there are certain social change that have gained much popularity and as a kind of uh, aware of the fact that uh, since 1940s, uh, 30s, a large scale transformation in the forms of industrialization, in the form of other pro process like migration as were happening. And very specific to Indian society was the process of kind of uh, uh, colonial rule which brought about a change in the structure as well as the economy. So, therefore, we also have the concept of westernization. So, the two concepts that comes in very frequently or rather can be considered as coined by Professor M. N. Srinivas in the study of social change is Sanskritization and westernization. Now, both the process of Sanskritization and westernization talks about change, One, but the level of change is kind of uh, different and therefore, it is very important to understand these two processes. He kinds of constructs a macro level understanding of social change using like micro level findings and therefore, these concepts like Brahmanization, Sanskritization, Westernization and Secularization. So, when we look into all these ization, IO, uh, terms ending with ION, they are all reflecting process of social change, but there is a kind of a dis difference in, in, in each of them and in order to understand Srinivas theory of social change, we need to understand each of them separately. So, we go to Brahmanization. Now, when we look into Indian society um, uh, or this uh, understanding of society in India was basically a Brahmanical view of Indian society. What was being reflected was what was being done in the upper caste and therefore, this concept of Brahmanization uh, becomes important in Srinivas work on religion and society among the Kurks of South India published in 1952. In this work, he kinds of uses the concept of Brahmanization to represent the process of imitation of life ways and ritual practice of Brahmins by low caste Hindu. Now, this comes in because there is already a theory which is giving us that there is a caste system, there is a hierarchy where Brahmins are on the top and the Shudras are on the lower level. And in order to kind of improve the status, you the those who are on the lower level would kind of copy or imitate the lifestyle of those on the up. And therefore, since Brahmins were on the topmost layer, there would uh, will be the model of uh, imitation of lifestyle would be obviously Brahmin and therefore, the term Brahmanization comes in. He uses the concept in explanatory device to interpret the change he observed in the ritual practices and lives of lower caste that he observed through intensive field study. So, basically uh, to bring it uh, with the idea or with the objective of qu critically questioning the assumption that caste system is a closed society, Srinivas gives us a theory of mobility in class system, uh, caste system and he gives us a, like a, in, in an attempt to explain that there is a, a level of movement from the lower caste to the upper caste, he uses the term Brahmanization. But very soon he realizes that Brahmanization is not actually the correct term to reflect uh, change because uh, the what is happening was the imitation is not only taking of the Brahman, it could be the first three or what uh, 
caste which is ca considered as twice born that is uh, those who kind of undergo the sacred thread uh, ceremony and therefore he will replace brahmanization with the term sanskritization because all the three caste in the hierarchy are considered to be sanskritic uh, and therefore the lifestyle can be considered as imitation of the uh, lifestyle of uh, a group which is more close to the sanskritic culture and therefore the term sanskritization comes in so srinivas introduces the concept of sanskritization in his study of the religion and kurg among the uh, i'm sorry religion and society among the kurg and he uses uh, it very extensively to explain the process of mobility and social change in caste system the reason why he kind of uh, prefers to use sanskritization over brahmanization is that he found that brahmanization is subsumed under the wider process of sanskritization and second is that brahmins are not an homogeneous uh, Uh, group that is to say that the brahmin in say north india or the lifestyle and culture of brahmin in north india would be different from those in south india so if when we talk use the term brahmanization what are we actually intending is are they imitating the lifestyle of north indian brahmin or south indian so they can be a kind of a conflict and therefore brahmanization was not the correct term the second is uh, is uh, the agent of sanskritization as i already said is not always a brahmin it could be a kshatriya could be a kind of vaishyas so it is the top 3 layers of the twice uh, born caste which is a reference point and therefore the term sanskritization is more relevant the term sanskritization brings about a Uh, different or an alternate to the orientalist view of caste system and the theory of social change using the concept described how upward mobility is possible in caste system now when we look into what is sanskritization we know that he uh, srinivas describes it as a cultural process cultural in the sense that it is large amount of change in the lifestyle dressing pattern eating things are taking place so the structure is not changing only change is happening at the cultural level so it is a cultural process of social mobility in caste system whereby a lower caste can move up in caste ranking by imitating the ritual way of a higher caste as i already said that since there is a hierarchy that is ranking and access to resources or the way you are treated in a society depends on the your position in the hierarchy there was an effort by those who are in the lower to move up and that is what sanskritization would tell us sanskritization of groups usually has effect of moving its position in the local caste hierarchy so now this is something that sanskritization is a very local level work it's not that if one caste is uh, say has changed the lifestyle and adopted a different the entire lifestyle or or all in pan india uh, thing is happening because uh, when we when we uh, talk about caste system in detail we see how caste system works at the level of jati it's not at the varna level varna is only a model so this sanskritization is only a regional concept it is happening at a local level and cannot be kind of considered as a pan india concept he considered sanskritization as among the three main axes of power now this is also important that he is writing at a time when there is lot of change they there is the whole uh, idea of nation building starts on economic transformation stake starts taking place and therefore in order to keeping in with the structural functional perspective he is trying to not uh, consider it as separate from other dimension he is saying that sanskritization will help us to understand the other dimensions so political economy and ritual and therefore the earlier understanding of caste system as a purely ritual or divine because it was kind of explained in terms of origin of caste system according to the body of brahma from the head and the uh, low so that hierarchy was a ritual hierarchy now when we look into the nature of caste system in say uh, 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 in post independent period 
other factors like economy and politica, politics becomes very important and there is a kind of a nexus and that is what becomes very important that Sanskritization will help us to understand the other dimensions of society. Now, when we look into the concept of Sanskritization, it is no doubt that it is one of a very important concept to understand process of social change, to understand that caste is not a closed group, but yet many thinkers and many scholars have pointed out at some limitations in the concept. First limitation is that he is giving us a Brahminic centric society that relegates the lower caste to lower strata. In many scholars have questioned that he is assuming the ritual hi uh, hierarchy as a given fact and is placing the Brahmins at the top and the untouchables at the lower. So, he takes on a model and goes on to explain further. So, he, uh, uh, is the problem. It has been labeled as Brahminical or top bottom approach of caste system because he is starting it from the Brahminical point of view. It is assuming that the lifestyle of the Brahmins are progressive and therefore, the lower caste is going to imitate it. The most important limitation of the concept of Sanskritization is that Srinivas was only talking about the middle level and that is why he is saying that there is no change in the structure. So, the uh, hierarchy remains as it is. So, there would be no example or explanation of any untouchable at the level of the say the Shudras imitating the lifestyle of the Brahmin. It was only Shudras who do, do at the, uh, 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 a level higher than them and say the Kshatriyas would do a level higher. So, the change which was taking place was only at the middle level and the two extremes would remain fixed and that is kind of uh, questioning the uh, pro con concept of mobility in caste system. Mobility that is involved in the po process of Sanskritization results only in positional change for particular caste or section of caste and need not necessarily lead to any structural change. It means while individual caste moves up and down, the structure as such remains the same. Sanskritization does not take place in the manner in all the places as it has been already stated that it is kind of a regional process of transformation. So, only uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, individual uh, group uh, kind of moving one particular uh, moves it does not imply that all over the country that ca category of caste would be able to consider to be at a higher level. And then sensitization model also kind of gets questioned now when we have the whole uh, discussions on, uh, around uh, reservation and therefore, the concept of desensitization comes in. That when we look at it from a lower to bottom up perspective, there are many castes who would kind of want to kind of get into the category of uh, at the lower level in order to get the benefits of reservation and so on and so forth. So, the concept of desensitization also comes in because there is a kind of reason why the movement need not necessarily be only upward, it can be as well be uh, downwards. After Sanskritization, the second important process looked by Srinivas is Westernization. Westernization is a process again a cultural change which is happening because of the contact with western foreign individual and here we know that uh, since India was under the colonial rule for a very long time the uh, influence of culture was strong on Indian life and there is lot of literature a lot of work which to kind of brings in both the positive and negative side of the British rule in India in terms of bringing in education, bringing in technology, transformation of social cultural patterns and norms has been uh, uh, kind of well documented. So, these uh, contact with the British or the colonial lifestyle and culture became a source of mobility for individuals as well as group. Now, when uh, sensitization is more in terms of a caste process of uh, social mobility, Westernization would be very close to a class model because here those individual who were able to acquire western education 
were able to move up uh, in terms of improving the economic status would kind of uh, be in order to be considered as more modern or a kind of uh, uh, more progressive would adopt the lifestyle of western society and that is uh, what the process of westernization is. He used the concept in an essay titled a note on Sanskritization and westernization in the journal Far Eastern Quarterly in 1956 which was subsequently included in his book Caste in Modern India published in 1962. Westernization refers to the changes introduced during the British period to the Indian society and which still continued in independent India. Westernization not only includes the introduction of new institutions but also fundamental changes in old institutions. So, basically it is only kind of uh, for instance uh, one of the most important uh, very common example of westernization would be where individual would give up their traditional attire and take on uh, the attire which is kind of considered to be uh, part of the western culture. So, you change your dressing style, you change your eating style. So, for instance, a very another very common example of westernization was that in India in traditional society people would prefer to eat with hands. But then when we uh, got in touch with the western lifestyle, people started using with spoon and fork. So, the whole idea of changing your lifestyle, your everyday pattern of lifestyle because of influence of a, a, a western culture is considered as westernization. Now, like Sanskritization, the concept of westernization was also subject to criticism and therefore, the first criticism is that westernization is not ethically neutral. So, uh, there is lot of uh, values attached to kind of uh, western economy in times of you know there is a kind of a mindset which kind of uh, creates a lot of values that this particular race, this particular uh, region, this particular community is better, is more progressive than the other. So, you kind of want to give up your own traditional culture and lifestyle because you feel the other is kind of more progressive. But then the racial prejudice is also a western value which is not actually ethically neutral. According to Daniel Bell, it is too local a label. And the model which is imitated may not necessarily be a western country, but it could be Russia. So, Daniel Bell is one of the critique of uh, Srinivas and uh, he makes a kind of an understanding that westernization is also kind of very loosely used in order to explain the process of social change in India. Now, when San, uh, Srinivas is using Sanskritization and westernization as two process for understanding uh, social change, he tells us that there is certain uh, level of difference between the two process. The first uh, is that is kind of uh, considered Sanskritization as I already said is in terms of change in the caste system. So, you have to kind of bring about a change because the whole assumption is the caste is divine, it is, uh, uh, it is kind of uh, uh, related to the religious uh, structure. It is also kind of when you kind of give up your lifestyle, you also quest, uh, kind of moving towards more uh, profane idea. So, because uh, uh, the whole understanding of uh, caste system in India society is that the fact that it continues is because it is uh, to do with the laws about uh, the religious uh, aspect, it is considered as divine. So, uh, for instance, if the uh, uh, Brahmin who kind of uh, wants to adopt for instance, a change in the lifestyle would then have to question the, his religion, he would have to move from a sacred outlook to a more profane outlook. Whereas, westernization itself is a part of the secular out, uh, out, uh, outlook, it is kind of a outcome of uh, secularization in the, uh, in, in the western countries where the state and the church kind of get separated and there is a move towards secularization. The second difference is that Sanskritization is a process of upward mobility by a process of imitation 
while westernization is a process of upward mobility by a process of development. So, we know that sanskritization you are only bringing about change in your lifestyle whereas, to be a part of the westernization you had to use uh, you had to take western education you had to start using technology. So, it is kind of part of the progress and development. Sanskritization implies mobility within the framework of caste system while westernization implies mobility outside the framework of caste. Now, modernization versus westernization, we know that there was a concept of modernization because uh, the term modern become becomes very important uh, in the light of industrial revolution and reformation where the whole idea of rationality and calculate calculation becomes important. Now, what is the difference between modernization and westernization? Srinivas points out that modernization is the popular term to explain the process of change brought about in non-western society by contact or indirect with a western. Uh, Daniel, Le, uh, uh, Daniel Lerner, he preferred to use the term modernization to westernization because westernization is local, it is kind of a uh, regional, it would, could only refer to western country whereas, even the countries in the east would be kind of developing, becoming uh, uh, more progressive in technology, using rationality, becoming more secular. So, modernization would be kind of a more uh, larger uh, term rather than westernization. Srinivas, however, differs from Daniel Lerner and argues that it is difficult for sociologists to be certain that a particular change is a part of the process of modernization. So, he is kind of telling us that modernization, uh, the term uh, like uh, westernization is ethically neutral and he writes, its use does not carry the implication that it is good or bad whereas, modernization is normally used in the sense that it is good. Srinivas points out to the other difficulty in westernization. He says that elements known to be part of the western culture were derived from China, India or West Asia. The concept of West is also not entirely homogeneous. However, having acknowledged these problems, Srinivas preferred the term westernization which he describes as inclusive, complex and many layered concept. If we look into the contribution of uh, Srinivas, we know that through his concept of Sanskritization and westernization, he gives us an indigenous sociologist for the study of Indian society. Thank you.